All right, here we are, as promised, with the one and only Peter Callahan, a.k.a. Ranger Gord. Peter, thank you so much for joining us here today. I love you, Dave. Don't go. <laughs> I know we just started, but don't go. <laughs> well, that's all the time we have. So, uh... <laughs> Now, Peter, a lot of, uh, a lot of our fans uh, who know you through the Red Green Show... They know you, obviously, as the the, the Ranger Gord character. Um, yeah. But I was hoping today, you know, I got you here for a little bit of time. I was hoping to kind of go back. You know, we had Pat McKenna on stream a few months back, and he talked about before any of the Red Green stuff started, he had met you and was performing with you at Second City or something. Yeah. Um, I can't remember if Pat was part of the touring company with me, or I think I just met him that was a main stage in London, Ontario. Okay. And that's where we first met. Okay. And, um, yeah, he'd, he'd always slay me. I, I'm, a, I'm a bad giggler at, at the best of times, and he would just slay me. There was one scene that we had to do, and it was all about him making me laugh after a while. It was, the, 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 the scene was funny in itself if we didn't laugh, but inevitably he would just do something that would just floor me. And, and he would come on as my son. And I'd be sitting there in a cardigan and a pipe reading a newspaper, and he'd look at me, and he'd gyrate. And I guess it was the genesis of uh, uh, Harold, because mm. he would, you know, his, his hips would be going nuts like a wind-up toy, and he would put a bathing cap on, oh. and the bathing cap would cover most of his head, but not all of it. <laughs> and he would just floor me, and there was not a chance in hell. And I, and the audience knew this, like you know, like. It, there would be a long pause between his first line and my second line, and I would I would try I would try every night, but he knew he he knew how to do it, and I think he perfected it during that during that second city time. Yeah, he talked. He always, he, I mean, Pat was always the guy that was so much better at improv. I was never that proficient at it, mm. because I I just don't like it that much. Mm. Like I don't see how you can write in front of a live audience with that pressure and entertain them as well as think about what you're doing. Right. But, you know, Pat, uh, you know, he has the gene, Colin Mockery has it, obviously, and a bunch of other people, but I, I never, I never really did. I never really got into it that much. So how did you get into Second City then? What was, the, what was your path to do with that even? Well, it was just a, it was just a natural progression out of, um, the classic, stage where I started, you know, I, I went to theater schools, um, mainly for Shakespeare in England hmm. and, in, and in Canada. And then my goal was to get into the Shaw Festival and the Stratford Festival. Hmm. And I, I went and I was horribly disillusioned, but that's a whole other story <laughs> for another day. Um, and then I came um, in, in, to, to find out about Second City and, and learn and hear what great comedy it had, and, you know, leaving the improv equation out for a second I, I i really wanted to do that comedy seeing where these people were going sctv etc mm. and um <clears throat> so that's where i ended up and i started in the touring company and then um uh, i think it was uh gosh 83 maybe 82 no probably 83 or 84 <clears throat> where um there was there became a, there came a hole at uh, for a person at uh, in London Second City mm. and I think it was Mike Myers pot, or it might have been it was either Mike Myers or someone else that left and I took over their spot in London. I see. And that's when I met Pat and, I, and a host of others. And uh, I mean, it, it, Second City is one of the greatest virtues of Second City is teaching you exactly what works and exactly what doesn't work. Mm. And you know, even though you do broad comedy or you're doing, you know, a, 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 an extravagant character, it teaches you exactly how far you can go mm. or how small you can go. Mm. It also it also teaches you confidence in your own voice, in your own um, verbiage, if that makes any mm. sense. Because you know, coming from where I came from, which was Shakespeare, you don't touch Shakespeare, you know. Yeah, you don't mess and with in, it. In, in Second City, you mm. you know, you mean you you do things like you know do mock Shakespeare and you do all sorts of other things that really teaches you that yes, words are important and yes, your the script that you got is probably better than what you're going to do, <laughs> but if you're afraid of it, 
uh, mm. you know, you'll be a talking head as opposed to mm. an emoting character, if mm. that makes any sense. Yeah, if, totally. If you, if, you can't, if you can't make it your own, then you're just looking at somebody reciting words. Right. That's cool. And that's, that's, one, of, that's one of the most invaluable parts of it. Hmm. And anybody that has any kind of fear of, uh, you know, public speaking, you know, in front of an audience live, which I do, you know, I much prefer not being in front of a live audience, which Red Green ended up being. Right. It was like the earlier years where we, <laughs> it was just me and Steve in the treehouse. Uh, <clears throat> the experience of being in front of a live audience, uh, it, 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 it taught you to get over the fear of that. Hmm. If only by a horrible yeah. incident, you know, <laughs> then you would come home at night and you think, oh, God, that was so embarrassing. You can't so, put me up there again. I won't oh, do it. Oh, gosh, and you walk off stage and, you know, your fellow cast members wouldn't look you, look at you because, you know, they didn't want to embarrass you. Oh, God. <laughs> but, I, you know, I was always <clears throat> a shy guy. I, 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 um, I was going to be a pilot originally, but mm. I sort of ended up in, uh, in theater by accident. I you know, mm. just got into some of the stage plays in... Um, in high school, and I found that it uh, it attracted girls, and I thought, mm. yeah, this is good. This, yeah, why not? You would have made yeah. a great airline pilot, though. <laughs> just, <laughs> it's just only for the uniform, absolutely, and the, and the, and the wink, <laughs> absolutely. Not so much the crying. <laughs> I don't yeah. know if you saw that Halloween meme that came, went around Facebook, but it was a pilot going down the main concourse of an airport. Oh. Outfit. But sunglasses and a, and a, yeah. and a blind walking. Yes, stick. I saw that. That was hilarious. Yeah. <laughs> he gets it. Yeah. So it's interesting you talk about coming from being classically trained into comedy. It seems like a few, like I think of like a Leslie Nielsen, right? I think of like Gordon Pinsent, you know, come, you know, kind of being these really, oh, really heavy hitting actors, dramatic actors, able to make the transition into comedy. And yeah. it, it's interesting to me why that works with some people so well. Because, you, I mean, your, t your comic timing as Ranger Gord, which, you know, a lot of the Ranger Gord stuff that we watch, I mean, it's, it's a similar joke being told over and over again. But you're yeah. able, it's like you're able to tell it in a different way every time with a little bit different timing, different, you know, different. And just all those instincts are there. So it's interesting that that came from a classical training. Do you know what I mean? I'm just. Yeah, yeah. I, I think I do. Um. You know, I mean, what the, 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 if you do Shakespeare, it, it is the same folio of plays over and over yeah, again. Yeah. So you've got to make them different. You've got to learn uh, what you can and can't do with the words mm. and, and how far you can stretch it. And that's that's exactly what they're doing today at Stratford. They're, you know, they're putting Coriolanus in a, in a mobster scene and, and mm. a set and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, yeah, I mean, I think that if I have a strength, uh, and I thank you for your words, but if I have a strength, it's playing comedy straight. Hmm. Like, I generally don't do the big wink-wink. Right. If what I do, I like to think that Leslie Nielsen was, was a good prototype for me because he, he always made me howl, especially in the early days when, he, you know, he didn't, he didn't make a broad face when, <laughs> you know, he said something outrageous, <laughs> yeah. uh, that he kept it very, very serious. Yeah. And the more serious he was, the funnier it was. <laughs> yeah, I agree. I totally agree. Okay, cool. And that's, that, that's exactly my, my kind of comedy, hmm. you know? Yeah. That, and I think that's maybe where Ranger Gord got some of his appeal, with, that, that he was so profoundly earnest about everything he did, <laughs> you know, whether it be marrying a tree or whatever it was, he, he, it was deadly serious for him because he had, he had nothing to do but think about marrying a tree or or you know deciphering what the raccoon was saying exactly <laughs> as bizarre as that is you know i mean even with i did a show called the newsroom and this guy would this anchorman guy would come up with the most airheaded ideas of all time mm. and, and i always thought that if i can possibly make viewers believe that i just said that for at least 10 seconds i've done my job <laughs> As soon as they think about what I just said, <laughs> they will laugh and not believe it. Yeah, yeah. No, I, de I definitely see that. And, uh, you know, that ability to hold it uh, and let the audience, it just that pregnant pause waiting for them to kind of catch up to it. it it's yeah. fun. Well, it, me, me and your dad were, were horrible, horrible gigglers. <laughs> he probably, is, you know, I mean, you probably witnessed some of that too, where he would look at me and I would look at him. And we'd realize the ridiculousness of what was going 
and we'd be gone. And it was it was so true, especially of the early days in, in Comedy Mill, the, the predecessor of, uh, of Red Green. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that too. So you, you were doing Second City, uh, did that for a few years, met Pat, and then kind of the next step in terms of, of working with my family, uh, I guess would have been Comedy Mill. So... How did that? How did that come about? Did you meet my dad or something? Did he do yeah, casting well, calls your for mom that? And dad. Yeah. <laughs> and this would have been mid '80s. Yeah. And I guess it was the show right after me and Max, right? That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So uh, they they wanted to do this thing where there was a you know the a supposed factory of comedy and we'd be in there you know chewing on ideas and making music videos. It was a pretty great idea, very right ahead of its time, I thought. Mm -hmm. And. Um, and that's, that's all I knew at the beginning. And I knew Steve and more I did a little bit because I grew up in Montreal and they were pretty much a, a, a Hamilton staple. And so I didn't really know what they were all about. Honestly. Yeah, you weren't exposed to Smith & Smith growing up too much. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Didn't get CACH in Montreal. Right. Anyway, so uh, the, the, the story I, I, I'm going to put in my biography, autobiography because I think it's quintessential Steve and it's exactly why I wanted to work with him. But they gave... <laughs> all of us a little monologue to learn and um I, I went away and i worked on this monologue and i came up with a few goofy bits and and uh, uh stephen morrig ended up coming to the agency on my agency and interviewing a few people that they were interested in at the agency in this little room and so they were in there and we you know we did the usual pleasantries and then i sat down on this chair and this chair felt really rickety like it was very you know, it bouncy. There was something not quite right with the chair. Anyways, off I go on on the um, on the monologue. They laugh. They, it seems to be going well. But right at the end, I'm I I lean back in the chair slightly, and the whole thing just absolutely collapsed. And I go ass overhead backwards, <laughs> literally legs in the air, and I'm horribly embarrassed. I'm not quite sure what to do about it. And I get up, and Steve said, whoa, that was something. And I said, yeah, it sure was. He said, and I said, I'm really embarrassed. He said, oh, no, 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 don't worry about it. You took it a lot better than the last guy. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, <laughs> we had a really good laugh. <laughs> and that was it. We were off. And and, and uh, to this day, I, I took the comedy mill. was the, the, Working on that show was one of the best experiences mm. of my life. I mean, we went in. Early in the morning, we came out late at night, and it was a day of laughter and uh, very, very little conflict. I mean, I know that Steve and Morag had a lot of issues with, you know, not that they were paramount issues, but they were, you know, they were a lot of technical things that were going on with the station and yeah. the director and all this, you know, other stuff that had to be done and it wasn't done. And it was, so they, 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 they shielded us from a lot of that and just kept laughs to us, for us, on, and, and I think that translated on the screen. And I, You can get bits and pieces, I guess, on uh, on YouTube, mainly the videos now, the music videos we did. Yeah, I think, I, I, I know I have some full episodes, I think I have the first season digitized now, so oh, yeah. they should be up on YouTube at some point as well, if it's not just the music videos, so yeah. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, we've okay. watched we've watched a little bit of it on stream actually, some of the the music videos and stuff like that, just to get a sense of, you know, Red and and Gord before they were Red and Gord a little bit. So it's yes, been fun. Achilles, Achilles, yeah. <laughs> yeah, Achilles. Oh man, oh, I'd forgotten about those guys. <laughs> it was Achilles, Gord, and Achilles. No, yeah, me. Uh, yeah, was it? I forget what Steve. Steve was in Achilles as well. Yeah. Oh my gosh, and, those and, were so and, funny. And like that just had more sense than, than Gord um, and would look at me Riley and, and you know I would you know we were talking about survival in the wilderness and obviously it was two camera we did all of this stuff two camera informing young people about poison oak poison ivy poison oak poison ivy oh god and I'd be covered with wealth um, and, and you know if it was an accident in the forest you know what's, what to do what to do I would I would plead with Steve not to eat me. <laughs> I had fallen and twisted my ankle or something. So um, yeah, that's that's where all that started. Yeah, those were those were funny times. I I remember being on set. That's probably when I would have met you for the first time too. I was just a kid. My brother and I yep. coming in yep. sometimes and playing on the stage and you know yep. pretending like I we were part of things. Even been your 
fire tower, like your treehouse that we used. Yeah, it, it wasn't actually, but it, it, uh, it, I was certainly at the right age to enjoy a treehouse, at least at the time. But yeah, yeah, definitely. So did you, did you know Linda and Mag before that? No, you, not at all. Met on the show. Okay, cool. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah, I mean, I think I knew Linda a little bit from Second City. Mm-hmm. You know, we knew of each other. Um, uh, but we had never we had never actually worked together because I don't think I did anything with her on second in Second City. Okay. It was all um, it was all during the Comedy Mill times. Yeah. Yeah. But well, I mean, my God, we would you know we would go up. I probably remember that cottage you had with yeah. on the Peach River or something. On, on Moon River. Moon River. Yeah. And we'd go up there and yeah. we'd spend a few days and we'd learn songs and we'd write sketches and have the grandest time. Yeah, I remember you guys yeah, out on it the. Was, it was you guys out on the deck singing karaoke and people would pull yeah, up and yeah, pull up exactly. pull up in boats yeah. and applaud and stuff. It was pretty funny. Yeah. Yeah. It was vodka and speedboats. Yeah. <laughs> um. So then, okay. So then, so Comedy Mill ends, and then now we're doing the red green the red green show. And Ranger Gord, you know, you're a character on the show right from season one, as you said in that treehouse. We had Sandy Richardson on a, uh, maybe a month and a half ago, and she talked about finding that treehouse, just driving home from work one day and seeing it and going and talking to the owner and saying, can we work back here? I'm just curious, yeah. h- how did how did my dad approach you, I guess, for the Ranger Gord character? What did you think of it? And maybe sitting in that treehouse, this rickety thing doing this weird character with my dad, did you think, you know, 15 years later, you would still be doing it? <laughs> well, I mean, I, you know, after after the Comedy Mill experience, I was I was mad to work with your folks again. Uh, nice. You know, so, and, and, and it was the same bunch you know like right. it was ch guys it was dandy and it was steve and yeah. Morag was there and you yeah. know so it was, we were doing the similar thing except obviously no women on the show yeah which apparently is why it does well in, in muslim countries yeah absolutely yeah, yeah absolutely yeah. they love it yeah <laughs> um but yeah i mean you know he the stuff that he wrote right from the beginning was gold and and you know he he would have me cry about him leaving and eating nothing but baked beans and Whatever it was oh, on those early days, I, you know, I'm sure I was there. And yeah. I remember that treehouse distinctly because I think there were actually people holding it up. Yeah. Stopping it from swaying <laughs> as we were shooting because the thing was designed for A 40 kid. pound kids. And <laughs> here we are, three or four grown people up in this thing on a ladder with a camera. Wow. And I think there was just enough room for the guy. It was either him shooting through the window or the cameraman sitting in the corner hmm. and with a wide as possible lens that it would just fit me and Steve in the lens. That's how small it was. Right. And Sandy always did his greatest job with finding gack that would go in this thing that would be indicative of a very, very lonely man. <laughs> yeah. Now when I watch the show now, um, I spot things on set where I'm like, that's my parents' sleeping bag. That's, you know, that's the lamp from <laughs> yeah. our house. I don't yeah. know if anything from your house ever made it onto the show, but it, it seemed a lot of personal items of ours yeah. down there. Oh, I believe it. Yeah. <laughs> and, and over the years, I think people started making stuff. Too, yeah. Right? Yeah. I think stuff ended up that people would make in Sault Ste. Marie and Salt Lake City and send it in and it would end up on set. Yeah. It's pretty cool, actually. It is very cool. Yeah. It's very cool. Now, uh, it, it really spoke to a lot of people, and I think that uh, credit to Steve and all the writers that, that it had this variety of characters that, you know, you could, you may not like them all, but you would like this person and that person, and, you know, you would wait for their things. And Right. I think my favorite was always um, Adventures with Bill. Hmm. Yep. <laughs> Just, it, it was so bizarre. <laughs> You know, and that goofy smiling face, no matter how horrendous <laughs> the injury was. Yeah, big thumbs up. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, certainly a lot of diff- a lot of sketches and characters that had a very different vibe. So you're right. A lot of people they would they would you know we had a little something for everyone. It seemed like. Uh, now we found um, one thing I've noticed too. You know, we'll go through the seasons pretty quickly on the stream. So you you tend to see you know 15 seasons shortened into just like a month and a half or something so we, we start to see that you know the, the way that uh red and harold their relationship changed over the years the way different characters um would come and go and the ones that stayed would all their jokes their first season would be about this so then about about the third season they would be about this and there's this kind of change that happens and i'm just i'm curious from your perspective looking at doing ranger gord for so long 
Um, do you feel like Ranger Gore changed over the years, that he had some kind of arc like that? I know certainly where we shot you changed. You know, you were in that treehouse for a while, and then we were we actually went up north to the real thing. Uh, I remember working on those sets and lugging <laughs> sandbags up that hill and up to the fire yeah. tower and all that stuff. And then, yeah. and then you were down in set uh, by the end of it. And then, of course, the cartoons came along, which we could talk about as well. But yeah, uh, yeah do you? W- w- what's your sense of the Ranger Gord character? You know, the movie as well. Um, did did it change much? Was it was it? Did it feel the same to you? Um, or, or what was well, it? Well, you like? know, I I think it did, and I think that the that the. The, the, the way it changed for me was that I think that Ranger Gord, the character, got more confident in what he was doing mm. because he knew that he could count on Steve getting, or, or Red coming up once or twice a month, mm. and, you know, uh, and, and, and so he would, you know, he became more emphatic uh, rather than emotional about things. Mm. I think that was one of the biggest things, and that, you know, that might have been an evolution of, 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 of me as a, as an actor or 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 the character, but mm. I tend to think that maybe it was the character that he would that, that he would have more to say. That you know the the, the, the treehouse became more elaborate. Uh, you know we were actually outside mm. uh, in the sunshine. Uh, I, I would be able to point in my own environment mm. and and have confidence about you know this is where I put the sprinkler system in case some more catches fire. <laughs> um, you know I, I you know. So many things uh, that 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 happened through the years happened with, I believe, to Steve's credit. You know, he had the wisdom to know that different writers would come up with different angles on this guy. Mm-hmm. And I never knew. Uh, you know, I might have it might have had a name at the top, but I never really registered where it was coming from. I know right. Rick Green wrote a lot of them. I think. Uh, did you write some? Some Ranger Gord stuff. Yeah. Uh, probably not. Not to the last few seasons. A little, a little bit, though. So there was, yeah, there was, there was stuff that came from all sorts of different angles that, um, that, that you know, gave him some sort of evolution. Um, uh, you know, and we'd, we'd always do these, um, these uh, uh, public broadcasting uh, little junkets, you know, with the, the pledge breaks and yes. go down to Des Moines, Iowa and a couple of places. And, we you know, we'd stand there with these people and, and we'd talk as the character you know, begging for money and <laughs> saying how important this is, etc. And that's that's really where that, that whole improv thing came into use for me because yeah. I had to make this stuff up as the character, you know, and it taught you how much you knew and how much you didn't know about <laughs> this guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that would be that would be some pressure, man. Did they have an audience there or is it just you doing it to camera? Uh, they had a small audience and okay. it was a lot of, you know, sometimes you would play to the people on the phone bank and, you know, there would probably be a lot of PBS guests hanging around. So, you right. know, you would get a few studio laughs, but it was, it was mainly to the camera. Right. Because they would go on for hours, right? And right. And you'd be there for four or five hours. Yeah. Or, or it would seem like it anyway. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. And they'd play a show. Yeah. Um, yeah, I remember one, I think it was Des Moines, Iowa, and there was a, there was a woman who uh, uh, was a hostess of the, or host of the show, and, and uh, Ranger Gore took a liking to her, so I made this whole arc from beginning to end of the, of the pledges that we would get, just get to know each other, the dating was going well, uh, we were talking about our future, then we were married, then we were talking children, and then by the end of the whole thing, we had split up. <laughs> <laughs> that's fantastic she, she got a kick out of it <laughs> yeah well speaking of women Blood getting a, getting a kick out of interacting with ranger gord as uh i think i mentioned you you've been voted by me at least you know most most handsome lodge member uh 20, 28 straight years you know I, I feel like paul gross was a solid second place for a couple seasons and then yeah. third place was was quite distant I think oh, yeah. I think actually all the mythical characters were you know th- three through ten, and then the other real guys were after that. Um, well, Albert Schultz was on there for a little bit. Albert Schultz, yeah, he, he little Arnie Dogan, little playing the guitar on there. That's true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's true. It's true. Um, Gordon Vincent, I mean, come on. Gordon Vincent has some charm, I'll say, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> but not as good a kisser. No. <laughs> I'll take your word for that. Um, <laughs> So, yeah, I mean, I don't know, you know, most handsome guy at the lodge. I'm not sure 
how big an honor that is, but I, I, let's say it's a big honor. And I'm just saying, you know, I'm just curious from your end, like even on the, even on our Twitch channel, we have females coming in going, when's, when is the Ranger Gord segment happening? Um, <laughs> and so I'm just curious, did you, did you get like, I, I saw a lot of our audiences, so this scares me to even ask, but did you get a lot of female attention from Red Green fans? Did that ever happen for you? Yeah, but it was uh, it, it was always very good natured. Yeah, you know? like fun, it was, right? It was, never, it was always, you know, yeah. married women with their husbands and them dressed, you know, the husbands dressed up as red or something. You know, it was never, it was never actually <laughs> it was never creepy too scary or, or yeah. serious. Yeah, okay. I never, yeah. <laughs> because the guy was so obviously wacko. <laughs> I'm sure there was part of them that would say, oh, oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> yeah, um, it's yeah, crazy. There was a few things, like when we'd go on, um, <clears throat> on these little... Uh, um, pledge break things and there was um, some very impoverished areas that we went to and I always remember this this kid made me up a um, it was like a circuit board that he had and it was all sorts of tubes and wires and and uh, and he had like a, a buzzer attached to it and he said look it's a woman sensor so Granger Gord will be able to find women with this thing <laughs> and uh, and you know so he would point it at a, a, a woman standing nearby and they would push a button and the buzzer would go off. Oh, man. See, it works. I, I was so touched. I, obviously, there was no way I was going to bring this thing home on a plane. Yeah, yeah. It wasn't going to happen, so I, I, had to, I had to abandon it, but uh, it, was, it was quite wonderful. How cool some, is that? Some of the earnestness of, of you know, and the, you know, the audiences that, that would show up. I have one horrible story. You can either keep this in or not. I don't know if you want it. But I'm keeping I, it. I don't know. You might have heard it, but... <laughs> We were doing this pledge break, and um, we were judging, con um, I think it was sculptures that people were given. Mm. People were um, given um, everything, a bunch of gack and mm. a lot of duct tape mm. uh, to make sculptures. So we judged those, and then there was an opportunity where you could have a Polaroid picture taken and get an autograph with, with all of our characters. So uh, during the first part of the show, uh, they would give us questions. So there would be questions for me and questions for Jeff Lumby, Winston Rothschild, and blah, blah, blah. And uh, so we would, read off, they would, we would read off the questions that were given to our characters, and we would make a joke about it. Okay. So one question came along, and it said, if you've had half your brain removed, can you still be a forest ranger? And I think I said something like, you have to have half your brain removed in order to be a forest ranger, or something like that. Ha, 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 we go on. Now there's this huge lineup of people, and I'm signing an autograph, and I can hear, uh, I can see out of the corner of my eye in front of me, there's a woman and her little boy, and she said, Ranger Gord, this is my son, and he actually did have half of his brain removed no. and, and would like to be a forest ranger. And I looked up, and she said, this is Jeffrey, and she turned him around, and there was this pencil-sized scar on the back of his neck. No. I swear to God, uh, there was no hole there. Oh. I, 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 I was, and, and, you know, so what could you do? You know, I, I said, oh, and he was quite lucid. He was a very smart guy. And hmm. I said, you're obviously a very smart guy. And, you know, if you like forestry, this is a great profession to be in. You know, and I just. Oh, my gosh. I, I, I got away with it. You got uh, set think, up, though, dude. Yeah. And that, but, you know, on, on one hand, I thought, why would the mother possibly yeah. put her son through this? Yeah. And I was a little bit angry with that. Yeah. And, but. When you think about it, it might have been the only chance that these people would ever, you know, if this kid really did like Ranger Gord and really wanted to be a forest ranger, it would be her only chance to actually ask, to ask a question and get a picture taken. Yeah, yeah. So you had to forgive them that, but um, yeah, it, it's, uh, it was, it, in that sense, there was never any kind of differentiation between people on TV, if you know what I mean. Right. So that, you know, it was, it, it, it could have been, you know, the Dean Martin show and Dean Martin, or it could have been, you know, the red green show. Uh, if they were on TV and they're each were as valuable as you, as good as you thought the show was. So mm. if you were in town, you could have been Dean Martin or you could have been red green. Mm. And it, you know, that you're, you're that guy on TV. There was no, right. There was no, this is a small show from Canada thought it was a, your equals. These people are coming. Yeah. That's it. That's interesting. It was. I mean, in, 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 Yeah, which is pretty cool, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's a crazy story, man. You totally got you totally got set up, though. I mean, to, to be handed something with the expectation that you're gonna kind of rip rip like riff on it comedically, and then it was an earnest question from some like you. That's that's a tough spot for you to be in, man. Oh God, yeah. it's horrible. Yeah, I, I didn't know what to do with myself. Yeah, jeez. I, I just, <laughs> Whoops. But like I said, where where would she get a chance like this yeah. again? With yeah, her, with her kid. Yeah, to be encouraged by an actual forest ranger, Ranger Gord. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, oh man, that's rough. Um, I did want to mention too, like, um, sometimes, you know, if I'm, if, if I Google one of the performers from the show, the first thing that comes up is, you know, best known for a character on the red green show. Um, with you, when I Google your name, it, you know, the, the red green connection isn't even on the first page of the results. Uh, and all that to say is you've done a lot of other things. Like when you look, your IMDB page is... Uh, incredible. I mean, you've done American TV, Canadian TV, movies, as you say, stage productions. Like, like um, you did a lot of uh, crazy, awesome work. And uh, I'm, as such, we're on a lot of other sets. You know, you were on the Seinfeld set, the Murphy Brown set, the Cheers set. You know, you've done yeah, Murdoch yeah. Mysteries here in Canada and stuff like that. And I'm just curious, that kind of puts you in, I think, in a unique position where you've seen a lot how a lot of other shows did things what they felt like to be on set what the what a day looked like what the workload expectation was what the budget was all that kind of stuff and i'm just curious as someone who's only really been around the red green set um how, how was 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 red green as sort of unique as i kind of think it as i romanticize it to be in my mind or or uh was it pretty similar to doing a lot of the other things that you did um you know, there was it, it was a very unique show, um, mm. but the thing that they all had in common, especially the successful ones, is that it was auteur driven. That that the, the the buck stopped right where you were at the time. Mm. There was nothing. If you look at and, and it's without exception, it's something that I don't think producers get to this day. That if if the if the power doesn't lie with the creative, with you know Larry David and Jerry Seinfeld, mm. or or you know, Rick Mercer or Steve Smith or, you know, uh, uh, who's the Breaking Bad guy? Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that, that's, that's, that's where it all comes from. And hmm. any network that, that gets involved with the creative process <clears throat> is doomed for failure. Hmm. It's like asking somebody to paint a picture and then telling them what colors to use. And, you know, it, it makes no sense. And that's what Steve always had to his credit that, if you wanted to change something, if you wanted to improvise this line, uh, it was it was right there and then that the decision was made, yay, nay, whatever it was. And when doing shows like Seinfeld, you know, you would come on and you would be the new guy, and and to their wisdom, they would know to embrace the new guy rather than to alienate him and say, no, oh, it's the new guy, you know, <laughs> because they always knew that they were only as good as their weakest link, right. and the new guy was inevitably the weakest link. So. The more they embraced you, the more they made you feel comfortable, the more that you would shine, and the more you shine, the better they looked, which right. is the wisest way to go. Hmm. But I did tons of stuff, like General Hospital and a bunch of other stuff down in, in the States, where it was exactly the opposite. They, you know, they would they would look away when the camera was on, on them, and they would purposely try to trip you up to make themselves look better by comparison, whatever it was, and it never worked, but that's exactly where... Um, uh, you know, Steve and, and, and these other shows that I've done, Newsroom, uh, you know, Made in Canada, they all had in common. And, and, and the quality of work that came out of this country, hmm. where the, where the, where the, you, you could tell the people were having fun, you could tell there was less pressure, you could tell that it was smarter, hmm. uh, it wasn't as dumbed down as what, well, hmm. not not necessarily what we're seeing recently because it's getting better television is getting better but in the past where it was just dumb it was right. just dumb stuff interesting hmm. um one thing i also wanted to ask you peter was um i talked to my dad about you know so you know coming up you know obviously him and rick coming up with all these characters for the show and how did he do that? We, we, have, we have a lot of fans who, you know, I still get fans asking, did, were there scripts? Because the performances seem so natural from, for, the, for a lot of the actors. 
And, you know, so where do these characters come from? And, you know, I always get this question about, like, is it even scripted? It seems like the guys are just talking. And he talked, and he talked about how it wasn't so much that the actors were all so prolific they could just inhabit any role, but that he would try to write characters based on a person um, and a personality trait that they already sort of had strongly. Uh, so yeah. not that the character was the same as the person, but that they would share enough, they would share something that that person could pull off that character and do it pretty naturally. And, yeah. and so I'm just curious from your perspective, do, you know, playing Ranger Gord for so long, do you have a, d- did you have a connection with him and that you felt you were similar in a certain way? Like what did my dad, when my dad looked at you, what, how did he see Ranger Gord? Cause you guys don't seem that, 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 uh, you know, you guys don't seem that similar to me. Well, I, I think that, you know, from the beginning, I mean, it, Steve and I had the benefit of being uh, for years in, in the comedy mill, in a, in a predecessor to the Red Green show, so that he knew where, uh, what I could do and what I could do well, and then exploited it on, on with Ranger Gord. I mean, the only character that he took from the comedy mill to put on the Red Green show was, was Akela Gord becoming Ranger Gord. Right. And in that he saw some sort of persona things that I think got more and more profound as the years gone on, went on, which was, you know, a, a robust earnestness, earnestness and, and um, some kind of, um, I don't know, a, 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 a ridiculous uh, self-righteousness, <laughs> you know, where he is going to tell you what is right and wrong. And, you know, he is the expert. Yeah. And I, and I think that, the more either lunatic or, or emphatic I, that, that the character was about any particular item, whether he knew anything about it or not, mm. you know, he would he would say, no, that's that log over there. We've been married now for three years. OK, <laughs> that's true. That is absolutely true. And and uh, and I think it, it, if it made Steve laugh, you know, you were in the right you know, you were in the right area. So whenever we sort of rehearsed the things and and yes they were always scripted you know we could always embellish here or there Mm -hmm. and i'd always add a little uh self-righteous nod or whatever it was or a tear or or, you know a a cracking of the voice whatever it was that you know we were free to do and and uh and he would all he would all always say yay or nay to something or other that Mm. you could you came up with And, and again that was the beauty of having the power right there that it was just mm. instantaneous this and i and i guess that that kind of chemistry translated itself very well over the years mm. and um yeah i mean I, I i i again i just whenever we got together and started to laugh it would last a long time a long time nice i don't know if you remember this is kind of a, a bizarre thing but at the very beginning of the comedy mill or at the end of it i can't remember there were credits for the people that made that, that made donations to the show, and we were wanted to thank Stars Menswear. Okay. <clears throat> so if you look at the comedy, you, know, you might see this, but it was my idea that w- that Steve and I would be far away in the distant background of a very dark set, like all the, the there's nobody around the set. It was very dark, and uh, and all you would hear as the camera started to creep around looking for these two voices were oh that looks really good on you no I think that's that's really great oh that, and the uh, the color of those the, 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 that color matches this guy yes I know what you mean I know exactly what you mean and that fits you beautifully that, that, that form fitting and so the camera is slowly creeping in and obviously there's just two people talking in the background and you finally find us <laughs> you find me and Steve and we're in complete drag like we're 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 wearing women's clothing and we're looking at each other <laughs> and we want to thank Stars Menswear. Well, the, the poor cameraman had to start this thing from, you know, I think it lasted maybe 45 seconds. So it was like a long tracking shot for this poor guy. And it was these old studio cameras on giant pedestals. And you could tell when we were about to go because we our, our voices would quiver in the middle of the take and I think there might be outtakes of this somewhere and then it would end, the camera would end up on us and we would start to laugh when we got caught by the camera because we were like two kids in a candy shop and just got caught anyway 
on about the fifth or seventh take, I started to laugh so hard I farted, <laughs> which made your dad just collapse. Anyway, so we, we, we certainly had this chemistry that went on. And, uh, you know, being in the tower and, and just laughing. Mm. And, you know, you would, I knew what to make Steve laugh. And, and, and Gordon um, had the same problem with Steve because Steve would have these sort of twinkly eyes that, yeah. you know, that w- you would just be on the edge of, you're not kidding, are you? <laughs> but at the same time, this look of incredulity that you know if you pay too much attention to it, it would send you off. So. <laughs> very, very difficult person to work with sometimes because it, it was just so much fun. Yeah. And when you're friends, you know, I mean, you, you probably know this, everybody in the world knows this. When, you, when you're when you working with friends, it makes it so much easier mm. and makes the work so much better than it is when you're working with somebody you don't care for. Yeah. No, absolutely. Like Lumbee, for instance. <laughs> Lumbee. <laughs> But yeah, that's something that I think I think fans of the show pick up on that there was this there was this the relationship seemed genuine and that it, it did seem to come out of a fun environment. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And and you telling stories like that about Comedy Mill as well. Um, I think that that translates. And uh, if you if your guys are having fun, everybody's kind of having fun. You know, it's like you're yeah. you're just jo- joining the party a little bit. I like that. Now, exactly. th- now well, that was part of the of, of what happened eventually when we went into the studio. Like I said, I mm. never was a big fan of doing stuff in the studio because you're doing it for the benefit of 200 people in the studio, and this applied right back. You know, Seinfeld was a live audience, Murphy Brown was a live audience, and Red Green was a live audience eventually. And I was never a fan of that because I always thought, if you're doing it, you should be doing it for the studio audience. You should be doing it in that kind of mm. technical way. But it was always Steve really gleaned onto that i think it was really his thing that he um he came from um a, a, a live performance background as opposed to recorded but yeah. i always liked the vacuum of recording he liked the live audience yeah i know from the creative side when i did eventually do some writing for the show that the the live audience was kind of seen as <clears throat> like um a writing tool it, it, you know it was it was instant feedback so we knew what jokes were working and what weren't so that the second show we could we could move things around or do some quick rewrites so it became a valuable tool from a writing perspective i think and then maybe yeah. for some people a performance perspective as well but but i know for my dad as a writing tool it was it was handy it was like having a little test crowd basically yeah yeah no i i, I certainly can see that yeah Oh, I was gonna. I was gonna ask you. You're talking about my dad and having fun with him on set, and <clears throat> that power sort of residing right there, and how important that is for uh, for the creative process and for a TV show. A lot of times, people come in the Twitch channel and they ask me, you know, what's your dad like in person, and is is he just like Red? How is he the same? How is he different? And I think you just pointed out a way that I find them similar is that they both have this sense of fun. You know, Red mm-hmm. is Red is fun. I think my dad likes to have fun and laugh. But a, a, a difference that we've heard from Pat and Sandy and others, and that I'm aware of as well, working with him, is that my dad has a pretty high standard in terms of sort of excellence. He has a high standard on himself, and he has a high standard for other people. And, and Pat talked about, you know, almost being intimidated sometimes coming to this show because, you know, would he know his lines? Um, would he be able to kind of meet that standard? And it, it wasn't like a mean, my dad isn't mean about it. He's just rigid about it. He doesn't move, Absolutely. he yeah, doesn't yeah. move off of his line. And I just curious your perspective. You knew him for, you know, a long time. Just curious, maybe talk about that a little bit, that side of it. Well, I mean, it, as you mentioned, the, the, you know, the, the first audience was always a barometer for what we were going to do in the, in the second audience. And I, and I always remember, because I'm, I'm, a, I'm a stickler for knowing stuff so that, you know, knowing the material, mm-hmm. and if you go up on a line, and you, because you have so little rehearsal, it's basically just a camera block. And if you're front of a live audience, you're on, you're doing it. It's 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 there. Right. So I'm always, you know, I always try to get ahead of the game by by knowing my stuff. But the fear was that in the first show, if you didn't get the last that he thought you needed or wanted that he wanted, that it would be changed by the second show. Right. So, you know, the, the fear that something mm. didn't work as well as it as they wanted it to, and you can see it in his face, you mm. know, you could, you could tell when something didn't go that well that he would, the, the, the cog started turning and, and uh, you know, he would, he would either be, it would either be your fault, you know, <laughs> Peter's fault, or it would be the writing fault, and it was always 
a guessing game for everybody involved which one that was and sometimes it was a combination of did he but, ever um, did he ever come to you between tapings and say peter i need more like i i need more sure, energy yeah yeah really? yeah i i i can't i wouldn't be able to give specific uh times mm-hmm. or comments but yeah no i remember uh yeah, you know, you can't, you can't do that. You have to do this. You have to, you know, um, um, uh, yeah. Hmm. I, I, it was certainly, it, it was certainly not common, but it, it was there. But I never, I mean, the only, the only intimidation that I felt was the fact that, that I would let him down and I never wanted to let him down hmm. in doing, in doing what I was doing. And if I felt that the material was strong, that I was not delivering it properly, I felt, I felt badly about that. And hmm. that's when, if it if it changed if the line changed because of my of my, hmm. of my uh, you know dropping the ball that would make me feel far worse hmm. uh, because a I would let him down and b I'd let myself down and the and the material down right hmm. you know I mean I, you, you, long enough in this game you would you think you would know where all the laughs are going to be and <laughs> I, I did the first play I, I've ever done well, I've done many plays but the first play in about 30 years this mm. past summer and uh, you know where you think there's going to be giant laughs there's no giant laughs and where you think there's going to be huge laughs whatever it, 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 it's hard to guess sometimes it really is mm. unpredictable and I think as seasoned as Steve was it always surprised him where the laughs were sometimes yeah no he talks about that too definitely you, you don't always know but yeah. the, the the audience lets you know yep yeah the um well I mean you know you know, obviously to be on the show for as long a run as you had on it, not a lot of people lasted. So you, you know, when you say that you were a stickler for knowing your lines and, you know, obviously more of your performances were bang on and brought more to it than was there, then, you know, if if he had to talk to you often, you wouldn't have been on season two. Do you know what I mean? So you can, you could take that as a, as a compliment that, he does have that high standard and you met it or exceeded it enough to stick around. So that, that's, uh, that's as good approval as he gets. He doesn't do mercy castings. You know what I mean? So, yeah. um, yeah. so good on you. And, uh, I know a lot of, you know, uh, every week I stream, people come in and talk about the Ranger Gord character and how much they like it. And whenever you come on camera, you know, there's, there's people talking in chat about how this is their favorite character and stuff. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, lots of people appreciate the work that you've done for sure. Yeah, and so I, thanks a bunch for doing this, by the way. Appreciate Pleasure. it. And I, I know you're just getting over the cough, too, so uh, I'm sure that's fun for you to talk for a long time. Um, oh, just, just cold. I don't know. Your listeners may have had it as well, but it's four weeks now. Four weeks? Four weeks. That's too And much. speaking of Jeff Lumby, he's had it for eight. Oh, no. For yeah. crying out loud. Okay. So you got four more to go, is what you're saying. Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> we haven't been kissing as much, so hopefully not. <laughs> So you talked about uh, getting back into the live stuff, and I, I know my parents. My parents went out and saw you guys, right? It was it. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, uh, we did the play. Uh, maybe August. Foster play at the uh, Foster Festival in St. Catharines. Okay. Great, great, great playwright. Um, very, very prolific. It was his 59th play. Wow. I think he's the most produced Canadian playwright ever. Wow. Um, yeah, so I encourage if any of your listeners are in the St. Catharines area, and even if you're not, check them out. They're on every summer, okay. all the summer months, okay. and uh, great venue, and uh, yeah, highly recommend it. Very cool. Okay. And what was the venue called? Maybe it was like a website or something? Uh, it's the Foster Festival. The Foster Festival. Okay, cool. Yeah. And okay. This, this play where I actually played uh, husband and wife with my wife, Leah Pinson. Yeah, so... Can you, can, <laughs> Can you tell me about that a little bit? Like, you married Gordon Pinson's daughter. Like, how yeah, the heck did, did you pull that off, man? That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> well, Gordon had a few extra bucks lying around. Yeah, smart. And we had some backroom talks. <laughs> and he said, you know, would you take her off my hands for X? And I said, oh, you can sweeten the pot a bit and I'll do it. <laughs> anyway, yeah, no, we've been together now for 18 years. No so, way. you know, I've, um, yeah. So, so two two thousand. Happy is my uh, father-in-law. So you guys got married while the show was happening. Yeah. Well, we never actually got married. Okay, so but been together, together, yeah. together, together yeah. since the show started. So, so you guys were coworkers when that went down. That was uh, that was that was cool. No word, no issues with that. What do you mean? I don't know. Like you're working with Gordon at the time, and now you're getting with his daughter, and like oh, yeah, no. that was fine. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean I uh, we, we never actually worked together, right? Because. Pat Shaughnessy was 
that right. were on with Rage of Gore. That's true. actually worked together. That's true. And it, it's only since then that we've done a couple of uh, films together. Okay. And one in particular where I played a very Rage of Gore like character was called uh, Big News for Grand Rock. Okay. Yeah. So okay. There you like Ranger Gore, check that out. Okay. Yeah, no, but it's been it's been a pleasure, obviously. Yeah. And, and, and an honor. I mean, he was. He's he such was, a great guy. Sergeant Scott in the Ra- in the Forest Rangers, way before your time. But it, boy, there there he was in front of me as my father. Yeah. Like, How lucky am I? Yeah, Canadian royalty right there. It's pretty. <laughs> yeah. Pretty awesome. Cool. All right. Well, thanks again, Peter. I really uh, appreciate your time. Thanks for uh, taking a minute with us. My pleasure. And uh, I had I such fun doing that show. It was it was quintessential time for me. I must say. Thank and you. Everybody. Well, it, it continues yeah. to be a source of fun for a lot of people, which is crazy. It, you know, 13 years ago was the last episode, and people are still getting a big kick out of it. So, thank you for the work that you did. Well, maybe they'll do a, maybe a movie. Another movie was is in the yeah the sequel. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It does it's supposed to be forever duct tape. So come on. <laughs> <That's> right. <laughs> All right, thanks, Peter.